So we were intentional when we outlined this sermon series and we decided to end it with Reformation Sunday and today's topic. In the Lutheran Church, Reformation Day is an opportunity, to, again, to rejoice in the incredible work of God through his people to ensure that his good news is what is shared with the world. On October 31st of 1517, Martin Luther, who was then a, a professor at the University of Wittenberg and a monk in the Roman Catholic Church, nailed 95 theses to the Church of Wittenberg in Latin to begin the debate on today's very topic. In the beginning, Luther's desire was actually not to start what has become known as the Protestant Reformation, but to cause debate, to cause theological study regarding the church's understanding of salvation and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So libraries upon libraries have been written since regarding the right and the pure teaching of the good news of Jesus Christ, that, that in his death and resurrection alone is one saved from their sinfulness. And only in his death and resurrection does one have the promise of eternal life in the very presence of Christ. So this is a very big word in the church especially in our heritage as Lutherans, and specifically from the church body of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. It's not an overly complicated concept to wrap our minds around, yet we struggle in its application in our daily lives. So Luther's and the reformers after him and the Lutheran heritage and others have fought with their pens and some even fought with their lives for the pure proclamation of the gospel, that it is only in Christ's death and resurrection that one is saved. And while we would like to think this is a historical issue, it is still very much alive in the church today. Though many at, at the church at large do not see it as big of an issue as we have maybe in the past, it is still something that we stand on, that we defend with every effort that we can, and it is the very thing that sets us free in this life. Today's topic is justification. And we're going to start by going to our gospel reading of Matthew chapter 5. So grab your Bibles, grab your the Bible that you brought in with you today. Parents, help your children look it up in their Bibles. Matthew chapter 5. This is a section of Matthew's gospel known as the Sermon on the Mount, specifically chapters 5 through 7. And it's a, a particularly familiar passage to many of us as disciples of Jesus, even if it's only been a few short years that you've been in this walk. But it's a familiar passage because there is so much to be learned from Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Here Jesus is talking to his disciples and to the crowd that has turned their ear to listen in, and he's making it abundantly clear what it means to be his disciple. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 13. Matthew 5, verse 13, Jesus to his disciples says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and to be trampled under people's feet. Verse 14, You, my disciples, are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Okay, this, this little section right here, these three verses, have become quite the popular text in our modern church, and for good reason. But that popularity, in my opinion, has come with some complacency in our approach to the text, myself included. Most of us read these verses and we think something to ourselves like this. Okay, I got it, Pastor Brian. My life should look a little bit different than those who are uh, not of Jesus. Got it. That's how I'll become salt of the earth. It's a weird metaphor in 2023 because I thought we were supposed to avoid salt but that's fine. I got it. Be different. End of story. Which isn't entirely wrong. 
Except when we do that, we stop processing the words of Jesus. And I think we actually miss his point. Let's look at these two passages together. Go back up to verse 13. Again, Jesus to his disciples says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and they put it under a basket, but on a stand, so that it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you, my disciples, will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Did you hear what Jesus said at the end of that section, which actually starts with verse 13? For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. How are you doing on that? Because as I read this, I actually thought about what my daily life looks like, even just this past week. I wake up, usually in a grumpy mood because I'm waking up. I make my cup of coffee, and then I do one of two things. Either I check my news emails that I get, or maybe I read a little bit, bit of the book that I'm working through, and then I do the other one. Around that time, if not before, my kids usually wake up and I grumble. And sometimes I do it under my breath. Most of the time it's out loud. I grumble that I have to make them breakfast. And I usually say something to the effect of, why am I making this? You're probably not going to eat it anyways. And then I go and I get ready for the day. All the while assuming that my day is probably not going to go the way that I want my day to go which, if I'm being honest with you, includes more naps during my office hours than I care to admit. And honestly, more often than not, during the day, I'm probably the main source of more than one or two cynical, sarcastic comments, more than I am the bearer of hope in a joy-filled presence. I try to smile most days. I really do. But sometimes it's hard. Then I head home, and I have the joy of driving the 183 to 820 to 35 interchange every day of my life. And I try to fight for that spot in traffic that will put me ahead of everybody else on the highway, <laughs> like that's going to happen. And then I get frustrated with the people who just don't seem to understand that the solid white line on the right side of the highway does not designate another lane. That's actually the shoulder of the highway not to be driven on, for emergencies only. And then I laugh to myself when they only get about three or four cars ahead of me. <laughs> Suckers. I make it home, thankfully safely, and I sit down with my kids to eat. Well, at least three of the seven days of the week. Most of the time, though, I, I get home and we're headed to karate or I have to go do something else. And when I sit down, I ask how everybody else's day has gone. And then when it's my turn, instead of a moment of openness and honesty with my kids, I usually just give them the generalized, hey, it was good, as I shovel food in my mouth. And then I get grumpy with them because it seems like it takes forever for them to get into bed. And then when they finally do get in bed, Victoria and I go lay down and we watch our show for the night until we're both too tired to stay awake. Fall asleep and I wake up and I repeat the process. 
Does any of that sound like any of your days of the week? I asked because as I was trying to write this sermon, I was convicted. I was convicted because I had to wrestle with what part of my average day do I appear to be the salt of the earth? What part of my average day do I appear to be a light on a hill? What part of my average day do I appear to be a beacon of glory to God and not to myself? And see, I would venture to guess that if I struggle with that aspect of the of the passage, you can imagine how much more I struggle when I hear Jesus say something like, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. My disciples. And I would venture to guess that by this point, you probably are struggling with that too. Maybe your day doesn't look like my day. Maybe it's the reality that you realize as you're sitting here listening to the sermon that you haven't said more than a sentence or two to your spouse today. And one of those two sentences was only one word. Or maybe you realize that you haven't thanked the other people in your household for everything that they do for the sake of your household, and you haven't done it in a long enough time that you can't actually remember doing it. Maybe it's the reality that the last time you and your child talked, you yelled at them, and now it's been days or weeks or months or even years since you last talked to them. Maybe you're actually thinking about the last time you looked at your phone and you were scrolling through and you just couldn't resist the urge to look up that really, really cute boy from high school just to see what he's up to, you know, just to see how his life's going. Or maybe it was the last time that you were scrolling through Instagram and you thought about your coworker and the beach trip that she took to Cozumel, and you know, you just wanted to see how the trip went. Or maybe it was the last time that you went to that website that, you know, gives you a little bit of um, release. For I tell you, Jesus says, that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, Jesus says that to his disciples and to the crowd that's listening in, and he says it to us because he knows what we do not like to admit. You see, Jesus knows that our righteousness can never actually exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And we certainly cannot do what is actually demanded of us. Verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them. Jesus says, I have come to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, it hasn't passed away yet, team. We're still here. Until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until it's all accomplished. We can't do this. But Jesus did. See, the very reason that he came off his throne in heaven was to do for us what we can never do for ourselves. He came to bring us our salvation. He came to live according to the laws of God. He came that his righteousness would far exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. He came to live the way and the truth and the life that God calls his people to live. He came to literally cross every T and dot every I so that when he took his final breath on the cross, he could look at you and me and he could say, it is finished. 
And with that final breath, he can also look at you and me and he can say, your sins are forgiven. See, that, brothers and sisters in Christ, is God's very declaration of our justification. It's that we have been declared forgiven. We have been declared righteous. We have been declared set free. That's why we call it justification and not sanctification, by the way. Because it's a truth. It's a reality. It is a fact that is now stated over us in the very grace and mercy of God because of Christ's death and resurrection. We have not earned it. We do not deserve it. It is declared over us apart from anything that you and I could ever do. What's interesting, though, is as the Sermon on the Mount continues, Jesus continues, as Matthew records, to express now how his disciples are to live their lives. Because he still expects them to seek to keep the commandments of God. They are still to seek righteousness and faithfulness and so are we we have been declared forgiven we have been declared free and still christ calls us to a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the pharisees now because he has set us free you know i'm not the best husband or the best dad or even the best pastor or friend, or co-worker, or neighbor, or citizen. But neither are you. I am a declared, freed, chosen, forgiven child of God in the very death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so are you. So what will you do with your freedom? I've shared this before at Peace, that our redemption leads to our faithful obedience. It's never the other way around. So now that you are declared righteous, now that you are declared set free, what are you free to do? Something interesting happens in the human heart and mind when we realize that we don't have to strive to earn somebody's love anymore. You would think that would actually breed more complacency. Yet interestingly enough, the harder that we have to work at something, the more likely we are to give it up. You and I no longer have to earn the love and the mercy and the grace of God. You and I no longer have to earn our salvation, our life, or our peace in Christ. It has already been given to us in the full. So that shame and that guilt that you've had because you don't talk to your kid anymore, that relationship that you screwed up, or you know that one little time that you cheated just a little bit to get ahead, In Christ Jesus, it's been declared forgiven. That oppression of your addiction that determines every action you take throughout the day. In Christ, those chains are weakened. In his mercy and truth, they are broken. Or that burden that you've carried on your shoulder for years, thinking that nobody else could carry it. Christ said, it is finished. That burden has forever been laid down. So in your freedom, what will you do? Maybe you reach out to your kid. And instead of trying to talk about the weather or what they want for Christmas, maybe you just start with, I'm sorry. 
Maybe you call that friend that you haven't talked to in years. Instead of asking them what they're going to do for Thanksgiving, maybe you start with, hey, I screwed it up the last time. I'm sorry. Maybe you look at yourself in the mirror today. And maybe you say to yourself, you are free. Maybe you look at your 10-year-old self and you tell your 10-year-old self, hey, it's not your fault. And God has been with you every step of the way and he never let go of you. And maybe, just maybe, when you and I see other people struggling with the same burdens that we have tried to carry for far too long, maybe, Maybe we put our arms around them and we say to them, hey, your sins are forgiven in our Savior, Jesus Christ. To God alone be the glory, now and always. Amen.